I was born in at Six Mile, which is part of Calhoun County. Oh, wow. I graduated from Bloomington High School in 1960. Played football and all sports, basketball, baseball, every, you know, was always involved. And uh, all my life, um, my grandfather named me after two war generals, one being General Douglas MacArthur, which is my middle name, the D I put on there, Wayne Douglas, and General Wayne Wright, which was a commander, or was one of his under MacArthur's. But from rather than Wayne White, he just spelled it out Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E. So, I mean, the military, I've had family members, uncles, and that, that served back during the war. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, that uh, I myself prided myself on always someday wanting to serve my country because I think that's the greatest honor that, that we can do and I think people will stand up when the cause is right. So in 1960, uh, before I started Victoria Junior College, I, uh, I uh, came to Victoria and uh, seen a sergeant by the name of Master Caldwell and visited with him a time or two and went back and told my family that I was going to join the Army. So I left in August of 1960. But I still have my records and my notes that, you know, they always tell you, and I was told before, when you want to enter a certain part of the service or whatever it is, make sure you have your orders and you have it down right and it's written in your contract. So they'll put you somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it is. And I, I uh, left here in August and went to San Antonio and was inducted. And went that was to, in 1960? In 19, August of 1960. Mm -hmm. I went, then we, after we did all our little testing and stuff in San Antonio, I shipped out to Fort Carson, Colorado to uh, be inducted into the military to receive the uniforms and, you know, get your shots and get all your, everything in order. And after that, uh, I was assigned to uh, a group called OVERAP. It was an over, overseas unit replacement, which was a, a trial, and I have it in my book here, a, a full trial of one unit replacing a whole unit. Mm -hmm. And we was also uh, sent, we, we did a new combat boot, and we did a new ration and a number of things that, uh, uh, so then we had for uh, training 18 weeks of, of uh, infantry and, and base, you know, basic training and then advanced training, then we had unit training. And we shipped out, I shipped out to uh, Korea in, in uh, September of uh, 61. Uh, I, uh, I was home on leave at the time and they gave me two weeks to come home and before I left and I was home a week and they had called me and uh, said you got to report back a week early because our, we was going over by ship. They had already sent the advance party over like they always do in the other groups. And I was in the main body. Mm -hmm. And what, so what was your specialty, your rank? Field, I was, well, I was at that time, I mm -hmm. was just a recruit in training in PFC. And uh, when, I, when I went to Korea, I became a specialist force class. And then I became a Sergeant E-5 rank when I got out. Maybe I'm going too much detail for you. No, no. I, I can tell you the whole story, you know. <laughs> we like details. We want to know, you know, we want to know your story. So feel mm -hmm. free to elaborate on those things like that. Okay, so I'm sorry. So there when we got to, after our training in Fort Benning, mm -hmm. when I tell you, we, we uh, they asked me to come back early, so we had to report back to Fort Benning. And then they flew us in the airplane a couple of days later like we were going to leave on this, we went over on the William A. Mann, which was a troop carrier. And once we got, they double timed us to the plane, they double timed us everywhere we went with bags and all your gear. We got on that ship, we sat on that ship for two weeks in the dock in California at, at uh, San Francisco before we shipped out. Mm -hmm. And then we was on the, on the ship for 21 days. I. Uh, particularly pride myself on when I first entered the service, I didn't know a colonel or enlisted man from one or the other, just as green as I could be. Well, in our first formation when we fell in and, and uh, after we got to Fort Benning, Georgia, 
the first sergeant, which was what they found out, always called the top sergeant, asked if anyone could type. So little old me, I would type 60, 65, 70 words a minute in high school, and I was a pretty good typist at that time. I still can type. I raised my hand in, uh, with all these 300 some odd guys. So after that formation, he said, uh, meet me in the orderly room. I had no idea what the orderly room even was. So anyway, I found out, reported to him. And my job was to, was to uh, the next day, all the men would come through that was in that unit and had to write a letter home to all the parents to let them know that their son had arrived. Mm -hmm. That time it wasn't no women there, it was just all, totally all men, you know, not, not like today. But I uh, had to take the names and addresses of all the individuals that were in our unit, in our, in our, in our company, and uh, address the envelopes. Of course, they filled the letter in for it. And after that, well, I got to meet the top sergeant. He told me one time, he said, uh, where are you from, son? I said, well, in Texas. He said, I thought everything was big in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so I became good friends with the first sergeant. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we was in there about our seventh week of basic training. And the sergeant, he made me also, after this time, he made me the alternate mail clerk. So every day I'd run down to the battle group headquarters and. I got a little time off from other duties that the rest of them were doing that I didn't have to do because I figured I volunteered. I volunteered to get there, then I volunteered after I was there, and it gave me a good shot or closeness with the first sergeant. Tell me a little bit about your living conditions at the time that you were in Korea, as far as food and your sleeping arrangements went. Well, we lived in huts, called Quonson huts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we. When we were in the field, we had the pup tents that we stayed in. Because we had the mess tents out there for your eating and all that. But when we were in, when we were in, uh, in, in, the, in the general area, like in the Camp Hovey, mm -hmm. Camp Hovey, Camp Casey, we had individual buildings. And of course, we had kerosene. It was cold and whenever, you know, it snowed there all the time sometime. And start in September and it, it stayed, you know, cold, very cold. But a different kind of cold than we have here. It was no humidity much. It was dry cold. The living condition was good. The food was good. I mean, we've always been, especially on mm -hmm. holidays and Thanksgiving and places like that, mm -hmm. we were able to, to you know, they, they fed us good. What was your impression of Korea? How, what were, what is Korea to you? Mountains. And mountains. <laughs> mountains. <laughs> mountains and valleys and, and you know, peaks. And mm -hmm. We'd climb up one mountain. I, I'm being in good shape and doing the first sergeant like I did. We had a company commander by the name of, and I need to tell you this, by the name of Rudolf Hausler. Mm -hmm. He was Cuban born. He was a ranger. He went through all the training that anyone could go through. And see, I'm being a radio operator. I was his radio operator. And I carried that radio and I could keep up with him and my, my little old steps, you know, I'd have to take four or five to his one. And he'd always tell the top sergeant, I'll, I'll try to lose this guy from Texas. I can't lose him. He's so tough. He's right there. Because we'd get the signal coming in, I'd have to tell the company commander what was going on. And he'd talk on the radio and back and forth. And of course, I, I thought that was good. I mean, I enjoyed that because I would got to be in a lot of conversations with uh, with intelligence and stuff like that, that a lot of other company commanders, I mean, other men in the outfit didn't know because I was there with them. Right. And if you hear, and if you're the radio operator, you get a call in where you, you hear the conversations that's going on, or where we're going to move, or where this one is going. And so we did, not only did we, wasn't in battle over there, but we would do it always in training. And, you know, and you have to train, like a football team, you have to train in order to be good if the day ever comes that you have to fight. Right. We found out that the, one of the things that when I went in the overrep unit, found out that they did discarded that a year or so after we got there because they found out that people that know everyone, we've got to know everyone, you get to know their families, you know where they're from, in war or in fighting, if you lose one of those guys, it hurts you pretty bad because it's like one of your own. But if you're complete strangers, 
and don't know one another, if someone dies or gets killed or hurt, you don't, it don't hurt you emotionally like it does if you really know somebody. Because we lived with them for that 32 weeks, 38 weeks, you get to know everything about it. I think the theory was good, but they found out that they don't make a good fighting machine. Do you think it's ever possible for North and South Korea to be reunified, or would you, re would you support that even? I would like to see that happen one day, mm -hmm. but the regime in North Korea is just so, you know, if it was up to the people themselves, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be no problem with unification. Because they're starving in North Korea. They're, people are starving. I mean, you can, South Korea is, you know, South Korea is a lot like the, like we are here now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it ever happened on kind of the communist regime. You know, we still have trouble with North Korea on nuclear this and nuclear that and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what do you think that we need to do to end that hostility? What do we need to do to end hostility? Mm -hmm. Between North and South Korea, or North Korea well, and even the United if, States. If you and I can sit down and talk and agree on whatever it might be, we can accomplish a lot. Right. But when the other person thinks you're trying to get advantage or gain something or whatever, and they feel that way maybe. So do you think it's important for younger generations to understand of uh, the sacrifices made in Korea? Not even, not just in 50 to 53, but even, you know, still, we still have, you know, soldiers there in Korea right now. Do you think it's important and necessary? Yeah, we're, we're in what you call the war is never ending. We're in the truth. Right, right. It's a truth. It was just an armistice. And they could mm -hmm. start armistice. They could start any day again tomorrow. Exactly. I, yeah, I think that, uh, that, to me, the young generation today, the younger people, you know, they don't understand what our forefathers and everybody went through. And for us to be free and be here, there was a lot of, a lot of things that had mm -hmm. to be accomplished. You know, the war between the states, uh, the, the war with England. I mean, you know, there's always been bickering and fighting, but I don't think young people understand what we, I say we, what our forefathers went through. Um, but thank you so much for coming in and talking. I hope that I, hope that I was okay. No, you did wonderful.